Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome once again to one of our winter webinars. The uh, Tuesday webinars are always uh, kind of basic, um, getting to know some of the functions of Rad Studio. And uh, the Friday webinars, and today, as we're recording this, is Friday, are more in depth and more um, technical webinars that explain certain concepts to people. Um, that are probably already familiar with the product or at least comfortable with the product and try to go more in depth about topics that um, experienced developers will find interesting. Today's webinar, um, if I show this now, uh, is, oh, let me find the overlay. There we go, we've got the white, right overlay. Today is how to find out if your app is vulnerable to hackers. And um, this is becoming more of an important um, uh, topic really. We get a lot of questions at Empire Calera about um, things like zero day vulnerabilities and people getting uh, buffer overruns. And, you know, it's always in the news now about some kind of systems being compromised and things like that. There are things you can do. You can obviously, uh, you know, follow some best practices when you're writing your code in the first place, not store documents uh, in you know, crazy places and do some encryption and th stuff like that. But actually, on a sufficiently complicated program, it starts to get very, very difficult. And one of the things that we want to um, talk about is some of the tools that are available to you that will help you um, get to the point where your programs are, your applications are not as vulnerable um, as they might be. And one of those ways is a thing called static code analysis. Our presentation today is from one of our, one of our tech partners, and actually Andy from um, Durst Scanner. I, I, I'm sure that's the company now. I always get confused between Durst Scanner and Durst Secure, um, but uh, I'm sure he's nodding his head in the background saying, yes, it is Durst Scanner. But um, Andy from Durst Scanner will be here. He'll be actually answering any of your questions that you have um, that you put in the chat. Um, we normally get a few of them here. Good morning from Victoria, British Columbia. And uh, hello, Bowani. And hello, Bizad, and a few others. Um, uh, we are going to have a presentation for about 30 minutes. We'll answer your questions. If you've got any questions about security, put them in the window there. And at the end of it, Andy, um, who is behind the scenes at the moment, will be joining us live and we'll be answering your questions live. But for now, let's go to the pre-recorded presentation. See you soon. Hello everyone and welcome to our session today. It is called how to find out if your app is vulnerable to hackers. Uh, my name is Andy Dankovic and I'm Chief Marketing Officer with Dare Secure. We're a technological partner with Embarcadero and thanks a lot for our partner to bringing us here in this webinar. So uh, I want to start with some context. Like every one of us are living in the time when the digital and digital transformation has come to like almost any company. But uh, with these uh, changes, you know, everything has become 10x more agile. So developers are in a rush and they take the very fast pace developing their applications. And sometimes there is a lack of comprehensive planning and unfortunately the security is getting left behind. So everybody is rushing and the people just download third party components from the internet, embed them into the applications without any uh, security check. It's just because you know they, they have to be in time for the new release and for the application to be up and running on time. And we understand it pretty well. But the issue here is that security is hardly following the developer's fast pace. Uh, due to the deadlines, we have to be taking shortcuts. So it's not a secret that uh, we may leave uh, hard-coded secrets in the code of the applications, for example, like passwords, API keys, encryption keys, etc. That can lead to these secrets to be easily extracted by malicious actors. Uh, sometimes insecure data storages and transmission happen, so uh, we don't don't use proper encryption methods, and uh, it leaves uh, the sensitive information at risk. Uh, sometimes we do rely on backdoors. Okay, we understand that this is easier for uh, access to the applications for debugging purposes, but at the same time, it can be exploited by the attackers. Insufficient input validation leads to 
vulnerabilities like SQL injections, cross-site scripting, buffer overflows, etc. And of course, this is my favorite part. We do rely on open source heavily. For example, like a typical typical model, modern typical application can comprise up to uh, 80% of uh, components that's been brought from different third parties, including open source. And uh, we just embed these packages getting downloaded from the internet. We just embed them in our applications without any security pre-check, but they may have malicious code in there and then will lead to potential uh, threats, code threats. The, the only question here arises, like you will inevitably have to fix all of these security issues. But the question here is whether you prefer to start fixing after a data breach or before one occurs. And if you prefer the hard way or the easiest way and the cheaper way, because uh, if we look at typical software development life cycle, you will see that if you find your vulnerabilities in the applications later, for example, when your application is already up and running, it's going to be very, very time consuming and uh, heavy lifting and expensive to uh, remediate all of those issues. So that's why we uh, recommend to shift security left. It means that you can start scanning your applications for security issues earlier in the pipeline and it will lead to the cheaper and easier way of fixing those uh, security issues because you know you're early at the coding stage and uh, you can bring back the test to the developers and they just fix it and then you build test deploy operate etc so shifting security left really really uh, helps you to save time and money and so uh, we offer start with early detection of known vulnerabilities uh, relying on static analysis uh, so you can scan application source code to identify patterns that match known vulnerability database. So with static analysis, you will be able to find hard-coded secrets, backdoors, SQL injections, cross-site scripting, and big, big number of other vulnerabilities. So this is just the most popular examples. And the, the great thing about uh, our offering is that our product that is called obviously their scanner. So we support uh, 36 popular programming languages such as Java, Python, C, C++. And of course, we support Delphi as we're a technological partner with Embarcadero. And uh, we see that there are like there is huge community of developers all around the world and so we do support Pascal and Delphi quite extensively in, in our scanner but if you use like a multi-language uh, if you develop a multi-language application it's not a big deal for us so we will detect any language uh, used in this application absolutely automatically and if it's a multi-language application there is no problem scanning it for security security vulnerabilities. And as we offer our view actually to bring to bring your uh, security scanning earlier to the coding stage, we understand that uh, you would like to have security not just an ad hoc uh, thing, but have it a part of the process. So that's why we offer uh, integrations with your favorite developer tools. Uh, such as repositories, VCS hostings, development environments, IDs, CI/CD servers, bug tracking, and even code analysis tools. And what is great about uh, their scanner is that besides all of those uh, tools that you see on the screen, we do invest in uh, our partnership with Embarcadero and uh, Red Studio support is going to be very, very soon released in their scanner. So it will be easier for you to uh, take advantage of static analysis from their scanner straight in your favorite ID ID platform. So and uh, of course everybody hates uh, false positives. Uh, we we know there are different tools out there in the market and it's a big pain 
when you, for example, find like 30,000 vulnerabilities in, in your application. It means you will have to check everything and understand whether these are real uh, vulnerabilities or they're just false positives. So that's why we have our proprietary fuzzy logic engine uh, technology in, in, in our solution where you can put a threshold so it will filter all the noise and uh, uh, get you read out of alert fatigue so you can focus only on the vulnerabilities that really matter for you. And sometimes there can be different situations where uh, source code of application is not available. For example, you have a legacy application and uh, it was it is outdated and documentation is very poor, it might be lost or you just have an app running and you don't have any any time left to actually gather source code source codes in the project or you want to make sure that you found every security issue including some exotic vulnerabilities uh, that can be harmful for your application uh, so for for this case uh, we have our technology that is called binary scanning so you will be able to unveil the unseen and secure the undiscovered vulnerabilities uh, relying on binary analysis it means that you can test binaries and executable files of your applications without any access to the source code uh, it is very helpful for example when you have a mobile application uh, on google play or app store so what you need to do is actually grab a link from the store uh, put it put it in our scanner just click start scanning and you will gain a security report ready with all the uh, all the findings all the uh, recreated source code and highlighted for vulnerabilities straight in your source code of your application so this is the science of magic uh, behind their scanner so you just sometimes if you have limited access to the source codes you can support uh, these types of files and these uh, use cases such as mobile application scanning or Java applications or executables or whatever. Yeah. So, and uh, you see as, as we're moving along the software development life cycle, uh, you have a web application life. So for this particular case, uh, we have dynamic analysis embedded in the their scanner. So it acts pretty much, much similar to like an external attacker, very much similar to penetration testing. And it will detect vulnerabilities that could become exploitable when application is live. So uh, dynamic uh, analysis in our product, it complements static analysis by finding vulnerabilities that SAS, uh, SAS might miss, particularly those related to runtime environment and user interactions. And the great thing about uh, uh, DAST and the SAS in their scanner that we can, uh, we can correlate and uh, understand the vulnerabilities that were found both by SAS and DAST. So in the product, you will just see that if you have scanned source code of your application and then you scan the running application with DAST, the vulnerabilities will be cross-matched and you will see the intersection where uh, some vulnerabilities have been proven and confirmed by both methods. So it means these are the most important vulnerabilities for you and you will have to you know, uh, deal, uh, deal with them at the, at the first uh, at the first uh, stage, um, if you if you look for some different tools uh, on there on the market, so for example, there is a SAST company and they partner with some DEST vendor. It's not it's more likely not going to be you know uh, integrated a, as much as we do. So we have static analysis and dynamic analysis under the single interface under the single dashboard. And both methods are working uh, corporately, so you understand uh, the security issues that have been proven by both methods. And uh, 
Sometimes uh, there are situations are situations where uh, there is a regulatory uh, requirements for your application. So, for example, you're in finance business or healthcare, and uh, you need to go through an audit and to make sure uh, you're compliant. So it's not a problem for their scanner. Just scan your applications and you export the report uh, in the way that supports uh, your favorite. Uh, Frameworks such as PCI DSS, OWASP Top 10, HIPAA, uh, CVE, SANS Top 25, and a couple of other frameworks. Uh, we're, uh, we're a MITRA certified uh, vendor, so uh, you can make sure that we are aligned with CWE and uh, all those vulnerabilities will be uh, aligned and uh, found according to the latest uh, information from MITRA and CWE database. And we al already talked a little bit about that uh, today. Everybody relies on so uh, open source nowadays. So, uh, but at the, at the same time, it, it is very, very convenient way to build your applications, but at the same time, you need to make sure that you can use open source freely. And sometimes there can be issues with the licensing. For example, uh, you downloaded some particular library and it's allowed to be used in, like, let's say, free of charge projects. But if you embed it in your commercial application, there can be restrictions and liabilities. So that's why uh, software composition analysis is a, is a great idea uh, to have your applications double checked in terms of open source usage. So you will gain uh, visibility into open source components, dependencies. You will be able to uh, detect uh, known vulnerabilities because, be, be, uh, before they become exploitable. And of course, it will highlight licensing risks for you and you can understand which libraries can be used in your applications and which one have to be replaced. So in here, I want to highlight like a couple of uh, infamous attacks that uh, have been around, such as Heartbleed, Equifax, SolarWinds, uh, Log4j. So, for example, in Heartbleed, uh, this was a severe vulnerability in OpenSSL cryptographic library affecting millions of websites. But if we imagine that uh, those companies could have uh, SCA in place, they could have identified the vulnerable versions of OpenSSL being used in applications and prompted an update to a patched version. So, in all of those uh, attacks examples, if they had... Uh, uh, software composition analysis that they could avoid uh, such uh, dangerous circumstances of their attacks because they would be able to to be managing open source in more secure way. And then here uh, I'd like to give you an example of a very emerging kinds of attacks. So for example, uh, you're working with GitHub and you found your favorite library for, let's say, data, databases, something for databases. But the malicious sectors just cloned this package and they made, uh, made, made it a similar name, just, for example, with double S at the end, and they embedded malicious code in this package. And for some reason, you just didn't double check the name, you downloaded this package, embedded it in your application and by the end of the day it's going to be like a cryptographic uh, uh, like a, a cryptographic threat and uh, your your database will be locked so to avoid such cases we scan github continuously and for each package that is hosted on github we uh, provide a security rating so, for example, you will see that, all right, you got a package and the health rating is 3.4. It means that it's a good idea to have a uh, closer look at the package and understand why it was uh, not like 5.0 or, you know, higher rating. So, it can, there can be different situations because the rating is low. For example, this package is not popular. It's been created recently. And the author of this package uh, was found uh, in online resources and he was a part of some hacktivism or something malicious before 
or we see that this package is not maintained properly by GitHub community, by the users, and maybe it is outdated. So we provide a number of metrics, leveraging those you can understand whether it's a good idea to take this package and embed in your application, or you'd better uh, be looking for a different substitute for this package. So that is what we call it supply chain security and their scanner, and it complements software composition analysis. So you remember software composition analysis helps you to identify known vulnerabilities and using supply chain security, you will be able to detect unknown vulnerabilities in your open source components. So uh, the uh, actually, this is what I wanted to present to you today. So uh, we're we, at their scanner, we provide you uh, with a platform that will be able to give you an opportunity to remediate your uh, application uh, known and unknown code threads ac across the whole software development lifecycle. So we can protect almost any application from both known and known vulnerabilities and integrate your security checks in your software development lifecycle. So to sync development and uh, security efforts. Uh, uh, we balance a couple of technologies like software composition analysis, supply chain security for open source security, and then you can scan your application with static analysis to find the emerging vulnerabilities and then to make sure that you found everything, uh, you can rely on dynamic analysis. And of course, if the source codes of the applications are missing, you can rely on binary analysis. So we provide different options for deployment and we understand that not everyone uh, out there uh, is willing to to be using the cloud version. So that's why we provide the options for you to select from. So on-premise installation uh, with this, uh, you will be able to take advantage out of uh, software development lifecycle integrations and SAST is really great for ad hoc scans or security audits. So why customers choose their scanner? Uh, we're a single application security platform we natively integrate major application security technologies and uh, we provide uh, detect correlation for the full context and uh, for the issues that really matter for you. So that is what uh, was uh, the example about static analysis and dynamic analysis uh, correlation. So we provide uh, technology for, for lowering false positive findings that is called uh, fuzzy logic engine, it is AI driven, and you can put a threshold of the alerts that suit your purchase better. Uh, we've been in business for a couple of years, uh, and we're recognized by Forrester among uh, leading SEST vendors. We're certified by Mitra, and we have really good uh, reviews on G2, so you can make sure like we're not new on the market. Uh, we have lots of experience and clients out there. So uh, our reports in our solution are tailored for both developers and security people because sometimes uh, developer faced uh, reports can be uh, difficult for security professionals to, to read. So that's why we tailor them uh, for security professionals with no development background. And uh, even if the source code of the application is unavailable, we can check running web applications, mobile applications, legacy apps with combination of binary SAST and dynamic analysis. And uh, we strictly rely on traditional, let's say traditional values, such as we don't have any bots. Uh, we rely on only classical people powered technical support and messenger chat support is available for enterprise customers. So if you're inter interested in making your, your applications, for example, in Delphi or C++ or Python or whatever languages uh, you're working with, so we encourage you to get in touch with us. We, will, we can provide you with a trial version or a pilot project. So feel free to reach out to, to us directly or to Embarcadera, who are our technological partner. So that's it for today. Thanks a lot for your time and attention, and I wish you to have secure applications.
Okay, well, that was a, a great presentation. I was just trying to find um, some of my slides because I've got some slides that have got uh, Delphi specific uh, things on there as well. But uh, what we'll do is we're calling Andy. I, I've actually logged into his demo site so I can show some stuff as well. Uh, but hi, Andy's joining us now live. If uh, Martha, you can turn it. There you go. Producer hi, Martha. Hi, is hi Ian. Uh, hi. Uh, producer it's Martha really is great to, to be here. Yeah, she's pressing the, bu the button. She, she's, uh, she's a wonder of uh, modern uh, uh, production <laughs> controls. So um, I, I noted down a couple of things because um, we've had lo lots of questions um, from people and basically people saying hi from various countries. Um, I noted uh, Spain, Cyprus, uh, Essex <laughs> in England. <laughs> my my ex-wife came from Essex, so I'm slightly biased against them. Uh, Kaiser Slauten in G uh, Germany. I'm probably saying that wrong, but more Im impressively, Transylvania as well. So that that's uh, quite a broad spectrum yeah, well. of people. Yeah, I, I was very interested in a couple of things you brought up, which I, I thought were were quite interesting topics, and uh, I just want to talk about them a bit more to sort of explain to um, the audiences in case they didn't catch what we were talking about. One of them was um, apart from DAST, which is dynamic analysis. Uh, if you just briefly explain what the difference would be between static analysis and dynamic analysis, because um, when I've done previous webinars and mentioned your stuff, I've not really gone into the dynamic analysis. So, what would a, what would a yeah, typical yeah. sure? Be? So, uh, static analysis is best when it's served with the source code. So, you grab your uh, sources of your applications, or sometimes if you're liking them, you can scan binaries. You upload it to the scanner, get a security report, and then will you guide you across vulnerabilities, security issues. So it works mostly with, you know, like, uh, you know, you do it at rest. You do it when you, you know, feel comfortable. The application is not running yet. You have plenty of time to fix everything. So that's why we offer, like, we, we recommend to do static scanning before application is running. But when to make, but then when it's all, all, already running, you, you can grab a link to your running web application, put it into your scanner, and it will try to hack your application. Right. And you will discover the yeah. issues that might be discovered only when the, it, it is active and live. Yeah. And so it's kind of one, the static code analysis is like having a whole team of people going through your source code going, oh, you've yeah. done something there that's dangerous and, yeah. oh, that's a bad idea there because of this. Whereas the dynamic analysis is like having a whole team of hackers trying to hack your actual yeah. running application. And that, that's my kind of dumbing it down. Uh, yeah, abs abs absolutely. It's, it, it's like, you know, having penetration testing, uh, but as a service that you can just, uh, you know, just uh, switch a button and, and do your dynamic analysis the time you want and to try because uh, actually in the product there are different options. You can do it is gently. You can do it in standard way or you can try to aggressively hack your application <laughs> and see like to, to challenge it and see how it reacts. Yeah, and I, and I think that's actually very interesting as well because um, some people just want to make sure that the obvious things have not been missed. And, and I get people saying, oh, you know, we're pretty good. We're pretty good at coding. And I don't, I don't care. You know, I, I work on relatively large systems. But I work on small systems as well. But it, once you get over a few hundred thousand lines of code, which is really not difficult, I, I've been in the business 38 years. And I, I, don't, I think I know what I'm doing. I guarantee it's impossible for anybody, no matter how good they are, to find every single thing, even if they sat there and completely focused on, on looking for vulnerabilities and stuff. I, I absolutely think it's an impossible task. But more importantly, it, even if they can do it, they've got to be able to prove that they've, they've you know, employed the best practices. The thing about static analysis is that it actually says, you know, gives them the opportunity to say, we have taken this service and we've scanned our code and we've used our best um, intentions to try and establish that there are no vulnerabilities that we are aware of that we were able to find. Or if there were, we corrected them. And that means that if you are writing for a bank or a medical practice or something like that, 
you're able to reassure your customers that you have employed the best possible practices. Now, the advantage of that is if something goes wrong, and God forbid you are your application is cracked or something like that, the chances are that when the horrible day comes to court, <laughs> where someone tries to sue you for losses, you can say, hey, you know, I, I get it, but we did the best yeah. we could. Because you, you can, answer, we, we, we did the best, yeah. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. No, no application, you know, security vendor like yourself or antivirus is going to say we guarantee it that we we will catch everything because it's impossible. You know, uh, uh, right now there's um, Windows Defender has got a problem with its heuristic <laughs> detection where it guesses. You know, yeah. uh, and it started deleting people's applications <laughs> based on uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong with them. They're just deleting them because it thinks that there's possibly. Uh, you know, a vulnerability with them. And I, I, I kind of agree that that's a good practice because you'd rather delete some good ones and not leave the bad ones alone. But there's a there's a lot to be done. And the other thing that you also um, mentioned were two other things, static uh, composition analysis, software composition analysis, where you're saying, and Delphi developers, this is very common for them, and actually C++ people as well, is they're using libraries or components in their software. And the first question I always get asked when people are saying, well, you know, is your code secure or is it okay? It's not just your code. It's the code of everything you've used in it. And that's one of the biggest yeah. problems for, um, you know, things like um, uh, N uh, Node, you know, JS, very famously, a uh, open source developer just yanked a library and then took out a load of programs because um you know part of the supply chain as you talk about it um suddenly broke or wasn't there anymore but it, it, imagine if they injected bad code in that which happens all the time on android apps you know someone injects some some components that have got um some horrible vulnerabilities in so i, I thought the s the composition analysis was that's a very interesting thing as well. And then the last one was supply chain security, which is where you're saying, you know, you're trying to validate that um, the things that you've put in there, that you the tools that you are using are also validated to be secure. So it's not just how you're writing your own code and what your application does whilst it's running, but it's the things that have gone into the make that application and the people that you've got them from are also validated as well. So I, I, I'm a very, as you know, I'm a very big fan of your products. And, and uh, you know, Embarcadero for us, we we were looking for a tech partner in security. And, you know, we've got a few that provide services. But for us personally, I think both of us have talked about this, and it's a very successful partnership because, you, you know, you offer a very comprehensive solution, and and uh, and it works it works well for us. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely yeah. creates relationship. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, you and I have talked at length about um, where we can go with this. And the other thing you mentioned in passing, which maybe people didn't catch, was um, that you're looking to also try and integrate it into Rad Studio more so that um, there's a slightly better um, kind of symbiosis between what Rad Studio can do because you're suddenly enabling a service in as well. I mean, you're not ready yet because that, that's our Yeah, our, our, our R&D is working, working hard, hard towards that. Yeah. Yeah, we have a server. So keeping my fingers to... crossed to, to to release to release it sooner. Yeah. Well, right now we're probably not helping because uh, as at the time that we're recording this, there's a, a server outage which is making everybody's life difficult. So I'm sure your R and D guys are like, oh my gosh. But, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. but there you go. I mean, that's actually supply chain security. Actually, it comes into it because if the people that provide your server suddenly, you know, something breaks in that data center, then it affects us. Embarcadero don't do their own uh, hosting. It's uh, part of idea and uh, when that breaks it, it's a problem for everybody so there you go okay well um we don't have any uh, specific questions about the the topic but um if people have got any they're welcome to put them in the um window but i i um you know when i've looked at your product in the past i'm just wondering if i can share my screen i'm just going to see if i can yeah let me see if i can um, move this web page over here and i think we might um I don't think there's any. I'm just trying to see that I make sure that my demo is not going to show anything that I shouldn't show in the the, uh, the app. So if I just um, let me see, I can add one of my screens. Hold on, share screen. 
This is something we do do very often, so I've just got to work out how it will work. There you go. This one. Entire screen. We want this one. Share. Okay, so um, I'm just going to hide you for a moment. Okay, actually, no, we'll, we'll leave you up. So what this is, this is um, your product, okay, or part one of your products. And um, assuming everybody can see it, which I think they can, this is a static code, it's a demo static code analysis of the kind of vulnerabilities that are found. And um, actually, you're probably better at me than this in drilling down but um i think if i go in here detail yeah results. just go to the detailed results yeah right there you go you, you can drive me by remote control there you go <laughs> so what when i've done demos before i signed screenshots and things like that but i thought there were some very interesting things like um what this is for those that don't know is an example project that um uh Der scanner have set up and in there is a Delphi project, an example Delphi project, and it's got some vulnerabilities. And I, and I like things like this. Um, so what's happened here is it has come up and said that there's a hard-coded encryption key in here. And, uh, you, you know, it's saying that it's hard-coded. When I select that vulnerability, um, it is actually showing me the line of code in my actual source code that has that vulnerability. And then just below our little images there, which is fine, is uh, an explanation of why that's a, a bad idea, along with an example saying why why you shouldn't. Do it. I mean, that's not a very good example, but um, but that's that's how it works. The other thing that um, I, I thought was interesting was this, which is a very typical um, uh, example that you get of people who are trying to be helpful to the user. So uh, this is a kind of Delphi related thing. So uh, Andy, this might not make a lot of sense to you, but in Delphi, uh, if an error occurs in this particular piece of code, what this loop does here, what this little block does here, is it swallows any error messages, okay? So let's say that, uh, I'm not quite sure what this is, the totals are not found or something like that, or I, I'm not quite sure what that means, but um, it looks like it might be um, uh, Portuguese or something, Brazilian Portuguese. But uh, So if that routine there throws an error, then someone is then using uh, swallowing that error, so the user doesn't see an error. Great, that helps with a more um, comfortable experience, and plus it means the program won't crash or just show an access violation window and die. But the trouble is that this is considered a bad practice by some organisations because at that point, if they then later go on to use some of these values that you can see here, they're using values that are potentially uninitialized. So this is the kind of security risk that the scan has found that I personally think you would find very difficult to, to locate. Now, you could do a thing called a grep search. You could go and look for, um, if you if you knew how to set up these um, uh, regular expressions, you could probably find a regular expression that would look for an accept and end with nothing in it, an empty block. But doing that on, you know, 500,000 lines of code, which is, I think, this is actually, this demo's got 800,000 lines of code or something like that, I, I remember. Uh, let's see, where is it? It, it was back on the previous screen. 83,000, oh, thousands, I think. Just go to yeah. the project. Oh, so going to here. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. There you go. So eight hundred thousand. Yeah. So this has scanned eight hundred and thirty-six thousand lines of code and found thirty-seven critical vulnerabilities, um, twenty-six hundred medium vulnerabilities, and nine hundred and fifty-two vulnerability uh, low vulnerabilities. Now, um, someone might say, "Well, you know, I don't care about the low vulnerabilities, but if you've got a, cu a customer, if you are writing software for a bank or a medical process or a government or something like that, you, you're probably going to have to account for what kind of vulnerabilities you've left behind and uh, and how, you know, how you're dealing with them. I really like this, this kind of um, uh, scan. And I think that the fact that it shows the actual source code, and, I, and I'm making a very bad attempt at demoing this product. I do apologize. But, um, but you know, using things like... Uh, 
this going down to drill down you could yeah again you could use a find you know you could say search on my source code and look for the http and find that yeah that is possible to do okay you could you could probably do that but uh this yeah. one here hard coded parsers and things like that not so easy that's not something you could search for unless the 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 property was always called password there are lots more complicated things here i've got a different presentation that people can look at on the blog website that goes into this in more detail and gives a more kind of thorough thought out presentation of what it is but i i really like this kind of static code analysis when i saw this demo it totally sold me on the idea uh, and yeah. but, um, but, but you know re regarding the hard-coded secrets it can be a low-hanging fruit for the team actually to start their security practice because you know everybody is afraid of hard-coded things and these yeah. uh, these things are relatively easier to fix at the first place you can actually start with hard-coded secrets and then as you move forward you can target more difficult vulnerabilities so for example you can go to open source security after that because again open source is easier to fix rather than something complicated in code yeah and and, and I th things like empty um, passwords i'm sure i think this is the one yes yeah, so, okay this is an example i've shown before um where what happens here is that someone is uh using again a, a, a try loop and they're they're reading something so they're, they're reading an any file and they're reading the database um name and server and the username and password from the any file but their default is to have it blank so if there isn't a value in the any file and an any file can be edited by any user with using notepad okay um that they, they go along and they could edit that so that your username and password now it's fine if this is a connection string um you know and it, it's trying to connect to the provider but what about if instead it was actually trying to create a connection in the first place and create a database and it's using blank passwords these are the kind of things that are are you know a bit of a problem really i and i and i think that even though you could catch some of these things by going through eight hundred and sixty three thousand lines of code if you were lucky all of the things that you show and there are many many different options um it's going to be hard to find them uh, johannes uh, van reason says please slow the generic exception error which one was that i don't know what he was talking about yeah i, th I think we can try to search by and you just type, type generic um, exception oh okay yeah it may have been something he saw down here generic exception okay let's see uh Generic exception catch. Oh. Is that what he's talking about? Yeah, there are different examples. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to go for those. I mean, it could be yeah. this that he's talking about. There you go. Generic exception. The website yeah, is just taking. Yeah. yeah. My mistake. I'm, I've, my connection's straining because. So oh, um, yeah. So what he's what he's asking about, Johannes. I think this is what you say is the generic exception catch, where it's saying if any problem at all happens, then raise an exception, and that allows someone to actually deliberately create a problem, which will then get raised. Now, uh, finally, you know, and uh, try finally loop is actually a good thing, but what he's saying there is that you know this is a problem and why is it a problem well the application can catches an exception of a general type make it difficult to diagnose and re recover from errors uh, yeah i mean some errors are expected like for example the server's not there because servers don't you know believe me we know about all that, that at the moment servers disappearing off of the uh, internet um but there could be other other reasons why they're going out let's just click on a few more so there's another generic exception you know, again, it just instead of catching specific problems and dealing with them, they're actually just showing an error message and saying, oh, yeah, something went wrong. Here's what your error is. Let's move on. We'll, we'll do the next bit and carry on. And, uh, yeah, it's a problem. I, I like this. I mean, there's a lot to explore. We're only really, it's not even scratching the surface here of the things that can happen. Uh, Lewis Kessler says, I arrived late, so I'm scrolling back to the beginning. No live chat for me. Lewis, um, this will be replayed. We'd all of the um, webinars that we show are um, 
replayed um, live. Let me just turn off my screen for a second here and come back to us. Yeah, all of the webinars that we do um, that live are always replayed and they will appear in the IDE in the learn section. So uh, when you open Rad Studio in the live section there, you'll see um, Andy's presentation today in this, this chat as well, including the live chat. And if you're watching on YouTube, if you click on subscribe and like, I sound like some kind of influencer now, I don't know, I should be selling shoes or something. But if you click on <laughs> subscribe and like, uh, you'll get notified of, of things like uh, forward events and things like that as well. But also you'll get to see um, the live replays um, uh, put back into the queues and added to playlists and things like that as well. So don't worry, you won't miss it. Even if you start late, you'll get to see all the interesting stuff, which is what Andy talked about, not what I talk about. So, yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, Johannes was saying that was the one. So what was it? Why was it a problem? Well, because you're not catching specific errors and it could be anything. And sometimes, you know, hackers deliberately create an error in order to throw an exception, which they can then um, exploit and things like that as well. But each of these things, as I showed in the screenshot, um, there's a, a vulnerability description of what that vulnerability is why it's a bad idea and then an example of what that what they mean by that particular vulnerability and then some recommendations and i think the recommendations there are um do not use an exception exception type explicitly and that you you should should use explicit exceptions for say a database error or um disk space error or a, a um you know file permission error or something like that and deal with those specifically and appropriately rather than just go, oh, something happened, I'll just carry on, and show an error message and move on. So, yeah. And also okay. there is one thing that I, I would highlight. We got uh, like a couple of requests recently and I know that uh, there are cases where developers need to go through some, you know, security audits. And for example, they can get uh, their application scanned by their, their scanner and uh, have their report exported into OWASP top 10 or you know sans format or pci dss or hipaa so uh the vulnerabilities will be aligned to the favorite frameworks and you can go you know your cloud security or date or you know HIPAA so you can or, tune you know, what you're scanning is what you're saying yeah, yeah yes 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 yeah. Yeah. very interesting and I, and I and i you know it's a topic that we we personally as a company of you know embarcadero is it's important for us we're getting more and more people ask about it uh Five years ago, people weren't so bothered. <laughs> and and <laughs> as I did uh, said in one of my presentations, if you go to our blog site, you'll you'll see um, on our blog site there, um, we get people that ask um, in certain regions, for example. And in fact, I'm going to put the caption up for the blog site at the bottom here. Um, certain regions, it's become more prevalent, but. If you go and look at my presentation where I talk about why you want to do worry about security and why even if you're a single, you know, I just write a little app for the App Store. I don't, you know, I don't need to worry about security. If you go to the um, my my uh, article about the security, I explain the fines that are available now for non-compliance. Even if you're completely, you did it mistakenly, it wasn't your fault. Uh, you know, in the Eurozone, it's something like 10,000 euros per um, breach and things like that. In the UK, it's 10,000 pounds or more um, per breach. And uh, if you go through and look at the data that I put up there, it, it you know, I can quite, I've quoted several times where people have been fined and almost put out of business because of breaches and things like that. But nonetheless, not only that, I don't know about you, but I get emails every so often. I've just had one from my doctor, <laughs> of all things. Uh, my, my doctor in the United States is a, actually a big organization, and they didn't get breached. The people that got breached were their data handling company's data handling company. And so what happened there was that I would go in and have my heart scan, and they do all my blood tests and say, oh, you're lazy, you don't take enough exercise, and stop you know stop yeah. eating cheese and all the other things your doctor says and uh, all that information is encrypted and sent up to a handling place and then the handling place goes and handles it off to someone else who spread it out to my medical insurance company to my life insurance company uh you know to anybody else who's legally allowed to have that information they got hacked 
and you're like, oh, well, it's okay because the data's encrypted. Unfortunately, the way they were hacked, they got the encryption key. So now someone out there has got all my very personal information. You know, I mean, like genuinely stuff you do not want people to know. I don't want people to necessarily know my weight or how often I, you know, I eat cheese and my cholesterol levels and things like that. Uh, and and yet it's happened. And that is just one example this year that I've had. You know, some exploit happened to me personally, and I'm sure you're you're not alone. You know, I'm not alone in that. You've you've had the same problem as I. It is becoming more and more problem. And uh, the reason is. There's money to be made in this, and and yeah. people would say, well, they you know they sell a million sets of details for ten dollars, but in some countries, ten dollars is worth much more to them than maybe in the United States where you wouldn't think it's worth it. You know, you think, well, I'm not going to jail for twenty years for ten dollars, but yeah, when you when you're repeating ourselves over and over and over again to you know hackers and crackers and even you know these types of websites that track down ex-partners, you know, <laughs> and all the other things. There's, It's not that you have nothing to hide. It's just that why why open yourself up to abuse for these things? And if you are an application developer, you're the one that they're going to come back to, looking looking to, you know, give explanations. Everybody wants a uh, scapegoat. And in the case of my doctor, the doctor said, wasn't us, nothing to do with us. It was our data provider, and the data provider said, oh, it wasn't us, it was these people. And those people, the further up data handling, they're having to pay for ID theft uh, protection, they're having to pay compensation, they'll probably get sued by uh, the US government, and uh, and a few, you know, the state of Texas will sue them as well. All, all and, yeah, and for make, one scan, probably, yeah, and, and it's not just, you know, obviously the things in the software, but you have to employ clean practices with data and things like that as well. It's a bigger picture, but... Yeah, exactly, it's, it's exactly, clean practices. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and, that, and that's the thing. And I, I, I really appreciate your time going and talking about it. Because, because okay, you well, know, what, 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 what we see, you know, uh, I really like your uh, clean practices uh, term, because what we see is actually when people are starting to, to secure their application, Applications they're already running, and they try to do. Let's say you know we want API security. Okay, let's try to secure APIs, or we are going to fix the mis misconfigurations in the cloud. All right, we fix that. Okay, then we're going to do some threat hunting. But you, you you see the problems that are in there with your application source code are still there. You are trying to do you know work around everything, but not the application itself. So uh, it, it, it works with some kind of, you know, level of awareness and maturity for companies to understand that, you know, clean security practices should be in there. And, and it's important to realize that I don't care how good you are, you're eventually going to get chopped up because it's an arms race. You know, it's, it's, it, the antivirus people know that. I, I am glad I don't work in antivirus because it must be a nightmare. But it, it is... As soon as you have got every kind of, uh, you know, possible uh, detection algorithm that you think you've got, that's it. We know every known virus. We've got we've got a scanner that will pick those up. You know, the antivirus vendors, okay. and then someone comes out with a new technique that exploits some Windows vulnerability that people hadn't heard about, zero day vulnerability, and they're back to square one because you know the, the virus gets exploited. There are markets out there, you know, not just on on the dark web, but just in general, available where there there are, um, you know, people openly giving away code that has got a multiple vulnerability um, scanner for the hackers. I had a website that I was managing, and it was under attack from a hacker, uh, and I used this example before, and uh, and we we use best practices. And it just so happened this one wasn't behind um, uh, Cloudflare, which I, I recommend to anybody if you're hosting websites. And there was one hacker there who was trying to get into this site, which was an e-commerce site. He used a tool that tried one million known vulnerabilities in just over a second. A million vulnerabilities in just over a second. It's got to be a state actor doing that. There's no way there's a yeah. regular person. There. And, and they threw a ton of data at that that website now we beat them because we were just lucky 
But if uh, that's a person using the tool that can try one million ways of breaking your website and they're going to have more time with an app, you know, because websites have got lots, you know, most web hosts have got lots of uh, traffic analysis built in to stop that kind of, you know, attack. But your apps don't get that, you know, and, and so you've just got to start assuming that someone's going to try and get you and, and do something about it. Um, there is a question here as well. I'm not quite sure what I understand and to say. What do you guys think about these platforms that allow you to encrypt code that will be executed as part of the license manager? I'm talking about Weeboo. Okay, so I think what they mean is that um, uh, it's, are you talking about self-modifying codes, uh, Sergio? Because most operating systems don't allow apps to be self-modifying. Um, it used to be a popular thing back in the day that you would encrypt blocks of your executable uh, and then decrypt it once some license code went in, and then it would run. And I, I don't think that's a practice used anymore. My number one recommendation for anybody who is writing code is code. No, you're not saying that. Okay. Sergio, explain a bit more and, uh, so I can understand. But uh, my number one advice to anybody who's writing applications is your first port of call is code sign your apps. Use code signatures um, and put a code signing certificate on it because that is... Um, that, that will help make sure that your apps are not um, um, modified after you've finished the compilation and sell them or ship them. Weeboo platform here. Okay, so Sergio says the Weeboo platform encrypts the code. Do you know anything about that? I don't, I'm not aware of that. No, I, I, I haven't heard about that yet. Okay, well, that, that's news to me. Yeah, uh, we, we should um, dig, dig, dig down into it. Yeah, we'll look into that. I mean, Weeboo, I think, is Chinese um, system, if I'm right. Um, I'm not. I'm not aware of that. It sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> um, I, I mean, if it encrypts the code in, the, in in terms of trying to prevent people, oh, it's through a tool that is managed by the license manager. It is a German product that seems very reliable. Okay. Does it deal? Well, does I, it deal with obfuscation at some extent? I think that may be, yeah. Are you talking about code, actual source code of obfuscation? Because that's something different. Uh, what source code, uh, for those that don't know, source code of obfuscation takes your source code and mangles the names up and moves loops around and generally tries to reorganize it to make it difficult to understand. If any of you have worked with other programmers and you've always got that one programmer that writes a piece of code where you look at it and go, what on earth does this do? Because you can't work it out. Well, obfuscation is like having a group of those people that took all of the code and messed it up so it was difficult to understand. Um, but it, uh, the thing about Delphi code is that even with obfuscation, it, it, it's, uh, it's going to produce an executable that um, works in the same way. AT says, I would appreciate if Ian and Andy would answer the question above of Sergio's one. See, I thought we were going to have no questions and then... Uh, no, I okay. Think right. okay, so I think he, AT is talking about um, most Delphi components. This this is a different person. So the answer about the Weeboo thing is, uh, I'm afraid neither of us know about that, and uh, I thought I knew quite a lot about it. Um, they store such data in Delphi strings. Okay, so uh, this is in application scanning that he's talking about. So I'll, I'll put this series of questions up. Most Delphi components like FireDat, REST, and that store data in strings and transform it multiple times. Okay, so what you're saying is in in memory vulnerability. Well, the, for a start, Windows does some stuff about that to try and prevent you trying to access application memory because they don't want you know applications to be able to read a other uh, thing. And so he's saying, and so scanning the app memory allows anyone to ac get access to plain credentials, tokens, keys, etc. Well. I, I'm not so sure that's 100% true, but um, the way that people crack apps is to do that kind of thing. So what they use is they load an application into an environment that basically is a, a, a kind of VM. And, they, and, and actually your dynamic analysis probably does a similar thing, that it allows it to run and then it's looking for the app um, to conduct certain behaviors. I mean, there are things like DLL trackers and registry key um, trackers, and they can 
spot, you know, what registering keys you're trying to read. So a popular way of um, breaking license codes <coughs> is to look for the registry keys they're trying to read to see if you're um, licensed. But, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to drink something. I, I was with anybody that knows uh, Jim McKeith. Uh, I was with Jim McKeith yesterday and we spoke nonstop for nine hours. <laughs> so, And then had a sword fight with helmets on, which is a long story. We'll, we'll talk about that another time. But um, <laughs> he's still as crazy ever. So, I, I what what is your question, AT? So, scanning at I mean, has anyone to access the plane credentials? Hmm. Okay. I. Uh, I I think that the dynamic analysis that you were talking about, uh, Andy would be something there is, that is is worth looking at because you're trying to find vulnerabilities, aren't you, in a running app with dynamic analysis. Is yep. that right? Yep. Yeah. And what kind of, what kind yeah. of things can the, the, the dynamic analysis detect? I, I can give you just particular examples straight away. Just need yeah, to, it just to depends on the app. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I... AT, um, I know you come on these webinars quite often because I've seen your handle before. Um, AT, can you email me and ask me some more questions about that? Um, you know my email address. It's ian.barker at embarcadero.com. And uh, we'll see what the answer is to that because I, I don't know. And it might be one of those things where, you know, you're never going to prevent every type of cracking and hacking. Because if it can run on a computer, then it's vulnerable. It's as simple as that. The only non-vulnerable computer is one that's made out of concrete and, and doesn't do anything. You know, it's 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 like that. It's like the only food that won't poison you is the food you don't eat. And and uh, and so, um, you know, I'm sure people like the NSA and uh, the CIA and uh, you know, various other countries, uh, security agencies, are able to crack anything like that. And they may be the things that can free, you know, they have a special version of Windows that freezes an app in memory and then they scan the memory for it. I don't know. Um, we'll have to have a look at that. But I think I think that's what you're talking about, AT. Um, but, but, you know, uh, what you start talking about is like Dest is mostly focusing on the vulnerabilities that are particularly for uh, running applications like cross-site scripting or SQL injection. So it will be working with like inputs of your application and try to hack it. Yeah. So um, Sergio is still talking about the Weeboo thing where he says the layer that is added to the code during encryption does a lot of checks like the presence of a debugger. So it's quite safe. Mm. Well, yeah, but you know, I used to, years ago, there was an app that I used to work on that um, used a thing called HASP. Um, which was a very interesting security key. It was like a USB key. In fact, later it was a USB key, but in the old days, it used to be a, pa a, pa a serial um, key that you would plug into the back of the computer. And that was the same thing, that the application was encrypted with a shell from Hasp. The company was called Aladdin. They would encrypt it, and then um, they had to plug that hardware key in, and a driver would decrypt the application on the fly. Uh, and that was actually very um, resistant to cracking. And they offered a bounty to anybody that could prove that they could crack the key. And for years, people were like, I cracked it, I cracked it. And then they go, no, you didn't. And they proved that they didn't. And then one day, they cracked it. <laughs> and that was the end of their business. Uh, they were like, oh, no, yeah, well, you this particular narrow set of circumstances. But actually it, no they were done and that was it so be careful what you wish for by asking people to crack things because <laughs> uh some some smart alec will come along and do it and they i don't know whether they paid out the bounty but that was a problem so yeah there you go okay well look um we reached the hour which i think we did pretty good really <laughs> um i've said before i i like your product i'm a big fan of of, of what you do um, we've done webinars before, and they can see those on on the main blog. If you just look for hackers, you'll you'll find it. Um, and there will be a replay of this on the YouTube channel, and uh, I think LinkedIn does it automatically, and Twitch probably does it automatically as well. But um, if you've got any questions, email me, and I'll if they're only for Andy, I'll pass them on to Andy as well. But um, yeah, you can see if, the if website. If you want to to try to try the product, you know, give us a holler on the website or through Yan. So yeah, we will provide like trial versions and everything. 
Yeah, and, and if they scan that QR code, and look, I've learned how to point to the QR code properly now, even though I'm reversed and mirrored. Um, if they scan that QR code, it would actually take you directly to, to uh, the Der Secure website, Der Scanner website as well, and uh, they can get uh, It's very interesting. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Andy, uh, for coming along, and uh, we are going to call it a day. Um, now, we are back um, next week on Tuesday. Uh, let me just pull this up. And next Tuesday, um, today was about hackers and vulnerabilities. Next Tuesday is how to create a real app that runs in the cloud. Uh, and we're going to show you some tips and tricks on how to make apps work and things like that. But in the meantime, um, have a good weekend, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks very much. <laughs>